Welcome to a cup of Joe with uh, Joe. Um, today we're going to chat about uh, air tightness and, and air barriers. And, uh, um, you know, a long time ago uh, when the, in the galaxy far, far away, um, one of the guys that taught me came up with a, a spectacular uh, phrase. He said, before you can control air, you must enclose air. You know, let, me, let me give that to you again, because I mean, that's, that's an awesome saying. Before you can control air, you must enclose air. That, uh, that comes from Dr. Doctor. He's a guy who had two PhDs, and uh, he, his nickname is his, in Boris, as in Boris and Natasha, because uh, he sounds just like, you know, give bomb to girl to kill moose and squirrel. That's Professor uh, Mark Bomberg. So if you want to enclose air, you must first, if you want to control air, you must first enclose air. And hence the concept of environmental separation and, 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 and air tightness. And the way you have to do that is you have to provide a barrier to airflow, and hence the term air barrier. Um, I don't like the word barrier because it implies uh, perfection. So I, I call it an air control layer. It, it seems much more reasonable because nothing is ever, nothing is ever, nothing is ever perfect. We, <laughs> we had big arguments between vapor barriers and vapor retarders and air retarders and airflow retarders and oh man, just air control layer. Well, what what makes for a good air control layer? Well, you you need to have it not leak air. <laughs> it's, it's bizarre. So um, how, do you, how do you define it? Well, you, an air barrier or air control layer is made out of materials, and these materials create assemblies, and the assemblies uh, create the building enclosure. And uh, so you, we said, here's what the air, air control layer material characteristics are. Here what the, here's what the assembly characteristics are, and here's what the enclosure characteristics are. And it goes back a long way. I was a youngster, and I was in charge of defining air barriers and air control layers in 1982, and I, I, <laughs> I had no idea what uh, uh, where to start. So I asked an old guy. I asked uh, Gus Handegard, and, and he said, Joe, that's a stupid concept, you know, air barriers and I says, well, you know, Professor Handegord, it's you're on the steering committee that tasked me with the job. Ah, just pick drywall. Measure measure ten sheets of drywall and and we're gonna use that as the requirement for an air control layer, an air barrier. And I said, drywall? He says, Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I got a friend from the Gas Bay and he's out in Edmonton and he's and he's building apartment buildings with drywall being air sealed as an air barrier, air control layer. And uh, he's, he's a French Canadian and he, he's got a famous phrase, uh, cherche la true. Uh, in, in, in French, uh, Gaspé French, true means whole. So he says, cherche la true, that's where the air goes through the wall. Anyway, Jean Claude Perrault. Um, Ten sheets of drywall I couldn't find. I found seven, and it turned out that the leakage of seven sheets of drywall in 1982 was uh, 0.02 liters per second per square meter at seven at uh, at, at 50 pascals, and uh, that became the air barrier material. Um, for the assembly, I simply multiplied that by 10. And that became 0.2. And then the building, I multiplied that by 10. So the 0 0.02 comes from drywall. The 0 0.2 comes from multiplying that by 10. And the 2 comes from multiplying it by 100. And I just pulled those numbers out of my butt. The fact that they got adopted is, is, quite, is quite scary. Um, turns out that they were pretty reasonable, but you don't, you don't just make stuff up. Well, apparently we just made uh, stuff up.
Now, it turned out that 0.2 for a wall assembly is pretty reasonable because it got the masonry folks to buy into it because if you take a single wide block wall and you paint it with two coats of latex paint, that meets the air barrier requirements for an assembly. And that's actually uh, you know, been adopted by many codes and jurisdictions. And it turned out that multiplying by another that by 10 gives you two. And that turned out to be about, you know, 20% of the buildings constructed at the time in the mid-1990s that had actually been tested would meet that requirement. So, you know, the top 20% of the buildings tested in you know, mid-1990s would actually meet that requirement. 80% wouldn't. That sounded pretty reasonable. So here we are 20 years later with 0.02, 0.2, and, 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 and two. Um, not bad for a giant, giant gas. Well, all right, so can we test these things? Well, yeah, we, 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 we can. We, uh, we can take a, a fan and, and, and depressurize the building enclosure and, and, and figure things out. Well, what about a big building? Well, you need a really big fan or dozens of them. Well, that's kind of dumb. Why not use the fan that's already in the big building? You just simply have, you usually have three or four or five large exhaust fans, turn off the supply fans and sequence the, so turn off the exhaust fans, sequence the incoming fans, and you've got a four or five point pressure differential. So you can do an air leakage test with a large building by using the building's equipment itself. Of course, you probably want to open all of the interior doors and stairwells to create a, a single zone. It takes you, you know, maybe an hour to set things up and 15 minutes to do the test. And all you need is a manometer and you don't need 20 or 30 fans. Uh, residential construction, it's easy to get a, an air, a blower fan, a blower door test. You put it in a door because it was inconvenient to put it in windows. We would have you know, blower window test. Now we have blower door test because engineers call fans blowers. So why do we uh, why do we depressurize rather than pressurize? <laughs> well, yeah, 1982 it was freaking cold in Toronto where I was working in January. I was told to pressure test a dozen buildings in Toronto, and a contract was approved to do it in January. It was awfully cold, so when we pressurized the buildings, froze all of the equipment. And I said, well, that is horrible, so we turned the fan around and sucked warm air out of the building. So we depressurized because it was cold in January in Toronto in 1982. If we had done it in the summer, we'd be pressurizing buildings rather than depressurizing. You know, why, uh, why do we test at 50 pascals? Well, <laughs> I was originally asked, to pre depressurize or pressurize to 75 pascals, but I didn't have a fan big enough to get to 75 pascals. So rather than pressurizing to 75, we depressurized to 50 because it was cold and my fan was small. I've had fan envy ever since. Well, a couple of years went by and uh, I asked uh, Professor Hanagord, now he was Gus, and I said, Gus, why, where'd the 75 pascals come from? How come we test buildings to 75 pascals. He says, <laughs> young Joseph, come with me. And he walks me down a hall at the National Research Council into his corner office and there's a little guy that looks just like Yoda. And it's Professor Tamur of Tamur and Shaw, you know, the legendary fire people. And Gus tells George, George, young Joseph here wants to know where the 75 pascals comes from. And Professor Tremura looks around, making sure nobody's hearing. He says, I didn't have a fan big enough to get me to 100 pascals. What's the point of this discussion? Well, accuracy goes up the higher the pressure difference. We now have the technology easily to go to 100 pascals. If we pressure tested 100 pascals, we get rid of the effects of uh, wind and temperature differences and fluctuations, it's a much more accurate measurement. So the higher the pressure, the better.
and apparently it doesn't matter whether you pressurize or depressurize. I know we've had those arguments for years about all oh, the things are going to flap around. And I said, well, yeah, that's if it's a mechanically attached, non-adhered membrane. Come on, get with get with the 1980s, 1990s. Fully adhere the stuff. Make it integral. If, you know, why would you want to use something flexible that flaps around in the breeze when you can have something that's fully adhered? Doesn't matter whether you're sucking or blowing and what the wind is. So you want a, a mechanic. You don't want a mechanically attached system. You want something that's fully adhered, or something that's built into the material so that doesn't flap around. So. Where are we with this? Well, I'm, I'm kind of done with my cup of coffee. And the message was that it's important to test your buildings for air leakage. Buildings can't be environmental separators if the air is going through them in an uncontrolled way. Um, and the best way to do this is with air control layers that are fully adhered or integral, so it doesn't matter what the pressure difference is. and the higher the pressure, the better. See you again sometime. Thank you.